scripture reading this morning is Acts chapter 9, verse 31. It's Acts chapter 9, verse 31. Then had the churches rest throughout all of Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified, and walking in fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. We are all very glad you're with us today, very glad to have the opportunity to be together. Rarely, if ever, that I can remember, have I used somebody else's outline for a sermon. When I first began, I used some of Clarence DeLoach's outlines. Since then, we were taught to make our own outlines, make our own study. Rarely, if ever, do I use somebody else's outline, but this morning is an exception. A few weeks ago, I heard a great sermon. The original points come from Donald McGavran who was an ecumenical writer on the subject of church growth in the 80s and 90s. We would not agree with everything that he said, but some of his points have biblical merit. The main points, the words, the main points of this lesson are his. A lot of the scriptural support was thought through by a gospel preacher by the name of Mel Futrell. I heard him present a lesson along these lines a few weeks ago. If there's anything right with this lesson, let's give credit to them. Anything that goes wrong with it, let's blame me. Here's the lesson. Everybody likes the subject of church growth, at least those in the church do and those who want to see the gospel spread. We like the subject of the church growing because that means the gospel spread. We like the subject of the church growing because that means individual souls are saved. We ought not like the idea of church growth just for the sake of numbers and just for the sake of filling a building or just for the sake of getting more money. Those ought not be considerations. Those are secondary at best and ought not be considerations at worst. The concern is for individual souls. We want people to go to heaven. But then if people become a part of the Lord's church, they do that by committing themselves to going to heaven. The Lord adds those who are saved to the church. Acts chapter 2 verse 47. So how does the church grow? There are three ways we'll examine. One by biology, two by conversion, and three by transfer. First of all, by biology. We know how biology works. Adam knew his wife and she bore a son, called his name Cain, said the Lord gave me a new man. Genesis 4 verse 1. Psalm 127 verse 3 is very important to remember. Children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Marcia and I were blessed to have two children. For the second one, we were in Jackson, Tennessee when Andrew was born. The doctor, whose name I forget at this time, but the doctor wrote on his birth certificate, the ceremonial one, Psalm 127, verse 3. Children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. The passage goes on from there to say, Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is he who has his quiver full of them. He shall not be ashamed. They shall not be ashamed, but shall stand with their enemies in the gate. In other words, what the psalmist is saying is sort of what God had said back in the beginning when he gave man the authority to replenish the earth, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. The psalmist is saying that it's a great blessing to a person to have a lot of kids and to have a large family. Sometimes I think maybe I forgot that. We've forgotten that. There's been a secular push the last 50 or 60 years for everybody to have fewer and fewer children. But the Bible still says that it's a blessing to have many children. Sometimes we even get to the point that we mock people that have a lot of children as if they're from old times or they just don't think through things very much. But no, no, the Bible still gives it its blessing. Having a lot of children can be a good thing. As a matter of fact, having a lot of children might help the church in some regards. But we'll get to that in just a moment. In Ephesians chapter 6 verses 1 through 4, Paul said, Children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. He's taking a quote from the Ten Commandments and making it applicable in the New Covenant. Generally speaking, if you obey your parents, if you have decent parents and you obey your parents, generally speaking, you have more chance of living longer on the land that God has given you. But then he says to fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. 
I've told you before, that's the hardest balance I've ever tried to ride in my life. Not cause them to rebel, but also raise them with the instructions that the Lord gave. And then in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 9, in a passage that tells us to be thankful for God's discipline, God said through his Hebrews writer, Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. How much more shall we be uh, in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? What happens when we have children in the church is that children are born to Christian parents, children are raised by Christian parents, and sometimes there is this generational transfer. We transfer our faith to a next generation. Now, I was careful to tell my children, I don't want your faith to be your faith because it's my faith. You need to search the scriptures for yourself and make sure that you believe because of the evidence and because of what the scriptures say. But still there's some element of what McGavern would call generational transfer. It's transferred from one generation to the next. We ought not think that this is not legitimate. This is legitimate church growth. Sometimes the church has shrunk by contrast to get back to a point that I started before Sometimes the church has been shrinking by contrast, sometimes because we don't have that generational transfer. Sometimes the pressures of the world around us are so much, and maybe sometimes we don't train enough. Maybe sometimes it's not our fault, but sometimes the pressures around us steal children from the faith that was once delivered that we've tried to teach them, and it breaks parents' hearts. And sometimes parents have done the very best that they can but children exercise their free will to go out on their own and away from the Lord. Church growth, when we keep them faithful, when they do stay faithful, that's legitimate. Just a few weeks ago, we had two young men in our congregation baptized into Christ. That's legitimate church growth. Also legitimate is the idea of continuing to have children and have many children. The Christian world, if I could use that in a very broad sense for a moment, has been shrinking, Christianity in the general sense has been shrinking, partly because we don't have as many kids anymore. The Muslim world is growing exponentially, partly because they still have a lot of kids. We ought to give those things some consideration. Church growth can be by biology. That happens. Church growth can be by conversion, and we know that that's very legitimate according to several scriptures. Acts chapter 2 verse 47 the early church was praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. When you are saved, according to the Scriptures, when you believe in Jesus Christ, repent of your sins, confess Him, and are baptized for the remission of your sins, the Lord adds you to His church. There's no group of people that gets to take a vote on you. There's no group of people that lifts themselves up and says, well, we think maybe we'll let you into our fellowship. No, it doesn't work like that. If you obey what the Lord says... He adds you to his church. That's conversion. People are converted from the world. In Acts 2, they were converted from Judaism to Christianity. They formed the church. In Acts chapter 8, verse 12, when Philip went to the city and the region of Samaria, the Bible says that as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, people believed, and both men and women were baptized. The Samaritans had been worshiping sort of some hybrid example of Judaism with some, their own temple in Mount Gerizim, but now they're converted. There was one demonic person there. He was a sorcerer that bewitched people by the things that he had to do and to say, but he was converted. When he saw the things that Simon did, or Philip did, and when he saw, heard the preaching, he was baptized into Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15, Paul wrote back to the Corinthians after he'd started the church there. He said, you may have 10,000 instructors in Christ, but you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Paul will call Timothy his son in the faith. What, we, what he means is that this new birth about which Timothy learned, this new birth about which the Corinthians learned, this being baptized into Christ and risen to walk in newness of life, the new birth into the church, into the kingdom of God, they learned from Paul. So in that sense, he was their father in the faith. Now, they weren't supposed to revere him as some sort of father. Jesus talked about that in Matthew 23. The point here is that these people were converted. In Corinth, they were converted from flagrant idolatry and immorality to the Lord's church. Remember 1 Corinthians 6 verses 9 through 11? Do you not know that 
the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor covetous, nor thieves, nor drunkards, nor extortioners, nor revilers shall enter the kingdom of God. Then he says, and such were some of you. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Those people in Corinth had formerly been committing all of those sins that were listed there. Not everyone committing all sins, we wouldn't think, but they had former adulterers and formerly covetous people and former sodomites. They had former people from all those categories who gave up those sins to follow Christ and be saved. They were a part of the church. They were converted. And then also James chapter 1 verse 18. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. How were we brought forth to be converted? How were we converted out of our ways, the sinful ways, the ways that grow corrupt, to be like God, to be a part of the divine nature, as Peter would say in his epistles? Well, the word of truth taught us. And then we obeyed the word of truth. That's how we came forth, to be converted. The preacher I heard give this lesson asked a chilling question. Who is a member of the church to some degree or another? Because of your influence. Who is a member of the church to some degree or another because of my influence? You know, I've preached my gospel all my life. I haven't had a whole lot of baptisms. I've mourned with people that I've buried more people in the ground than I have in the water. I'd like to think at the end of my life, though, that somebody made it to heaven, at least in part, because of my influence. Now, that's not going to get me a higher place in heaven. 1 Corinthians 3 teaches that a person may work and work and work and still all his work on earth be lost, spiritually speaking. That is, nobody makes it to heaven, but he himself will be saved. But it will be a trial for him, yet so as through fire. But the question is a challenge because it challenges us to make some effort, doesn't it? It's not just the preacher's job and it's not just the elder's job. Why do Christians exist? To make more Christians. That's the commission that we have from Jesus in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. To convert more people. That's legitimate church growth. And then sometimes churches grow by transfer. That is, somebody comes from Wheeling, somebody comes from Shadyside, somebody comes from New Martinsville, and they decide they want to place their membership here. It's almost, it's sort of like Paul did in Acts chapter 9, verse 26, after he was converted in the city of Damascus, and they ran him out. He came to Jerusalem and tried to join the disciples, Acts 9 verse 26, but the disciples were afraid of him. Why? Because he'd been a persecutor of Christians, as he himself admits in Galatians 1, 13 and 14. But he's trying to ally himself with the disciples in a city so that he can be a part of one group of people. Even though he would travel a lot, he wanted to be a part of one particular local congregation the way God designed it. Is Church growth by transfer legitimate? Sometimes yes and sometimes no. There may be churches who have become unfaithful. You remember in Revelation chapter 2, Paul, I'm sorry, John is writing down Jesus' words to the church at Ephesus. And he says, you've done a lot of things right. You've tested those who are apostles and found them to be liars. You did that right. You're faithful in your work and your love and your patience. That's all good. Or work in patience anyway. But he said, you've left your first love. And he said to them, therefore remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the first works unless I come or else I will come and take your lampstand out of its and remove it from its place unless you repent. The lampstand represented their congregation. He said, your lampstand will be removed unless you repent. Now if there are churches around that started out in a biblical pattern but then became very unbiblical and people start leaving them to worship where there is a biblical pattern still being employed, that's legitimate church growth. But we don't want church growth by going out to a legitimate congregation, a biblical congregation, and just trying to persuade people to come over here to be a part of our little group. No, that's, that's illegitimate. But that's one way that churches grow. Biology, conversion, and transfer. And then we might ask these questions, or this question, how do we measure church growth? There might be three ways. Numerically often comes to mind. Are we filling the pews? Do people come? Are they here? Are they part of the Lord's church? Are they baptized? How many? 
Then we might measure church growth spiritually. How are people growing? Are they advancing in their understanding of the scriptures? Are they advancing in the way that they treat people? Are they becoming less like the world and more like God? And organically, and the way we're using that word is that people naturally, something natural comes about and people naturally bond together. First look at numerically. That's biblical. In Acts chapter 2 verse 41, when the church started, Peter preached the first sermon on the day of Pentecost. The people who heard the word gladly received it and 3,000 souls were added to them that day. In Acts chapter 4 verse 4, we have the last specific number of the church that's given. But you'll see that the church didn't stop growing. The word of God, uh, many who heard the word believed and the number of men came to be about 5,000. We don't know how many total there were. But the number of men at that time came to be about 5,000. And then in Acts chapter 5 verse 14, believers were increasingly added to the Lord multitudes, multitudes of both men and women. And then in Acts chapter 6 verse 7, and the word of God spread and the number of the disciples was multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Jesus had predicted this early church growth in a parable that he taught. At the end of Matthew 13 and then in parallel passages, he taught a parable about a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds, but grows up to such a big plant one summer's time. He said the church would be like that. It would start out. And think about why it was. Because people were waiting for the Messiah. He'd come. Many of them understood this was the Messiah from the evidence. And they're converted from Judaism to Christianity when God makes the change from Judaism being the authorized religion to Christianity being the authorized religion. They're converted. And they're converted in great numbers. What happens when you multiply thousands by thousands? They had thousands to start with. And then they keep using the word multiplied. What happens? They're growing quickly. And the word of God would spread all over that first century world, all over the Mediterranean world through Paul's missionaries' journeys, and so many people would be baptized. And in three centuries, the Roman Empire would relinquish its claim to be the religious authority in the world and allow Christ to be the authority. That had its problems, but at least they made that recognition. And all that was without TV. And all of that was without newspaper and without social media, but people going on foot and people going by boat and traveling and talking to other people. And that's how the church grew numerically. But if we focus only here, we've missed it. If we focus only on numbers, we may be tempted to compromise God's word to get big numbers. We could get big numbers by compromising God's word. If we told people that they could live however they wanted to live, if we told people that they need not change their lives to conform to the gospel of Christ, we could fill the building several times over with shallow, selfish believers, couldn't we? But when we say, as Jesus said, if you love Jesus, keep his commandments. And when we say there are moral situations that need to be worked out, and when we say that there are commandments to be followed and worship regulations that need to be heeded, then a lot of people aren't going to come. As Jesus said that a lot of people wouldn't come in Matthew 7, 13, and 14. So we can't focus only on numbers. Church growth is also spiritually. In Acts chapter 16, verse 5, you have sort of a, a, a bridge to the previous point. They were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. What came first? They were strengthened in the faith. They had their faith deepened. They learned more about the word of God. And then the numbers came. You also might think of Acts chapter 9 verse 31 which was read for us. Acts chapter 9 verse 31. Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord, they changed their ways. And the comfort of the Holy Spirit, God helped them. They were multiplied. After they had peace, after they had edification building up, then they were multiplied. Mel Futrell quoted Avon Malone, who was one of his professors, as saying, as a summation of this verse, peace plus edification equals multiplication. If you have peace in a local congregation and people are giving themselves to being spiritually built up, the multiplication will come. That's how God's design seems to be. And then we have 1 Corinthians 3 verse 6 where we're reminded that it's not our job to force people to obey the gospel. In fact, we can't do it. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. 
We plant and we water God's word. We sow it. We try to keep it. We try to tend it. But when people are going to obey God's word, it has to be their own decision. And then you have passages like 1 Peter 2 verse 2 where Peter says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Have you ever desired the word of God like that? Have you ever been around a newborn babe that wants his or her mother's milk? They make it known, don't they? They make it known pretty loudly, don't they? And they're pretty intent on that. A book's not going to satisfy them. I'm not saying I spent a week with grandkids a couple weeks ago, but just listen. A, a, a book won't satisfy them. A, a ride on the shoulders won't satisfy them. They want mom and they want milk. As newborn babes that desire the, as newborn babes desire milk, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. How much do you desire God's word? Well, it's probably reflected in how much time you spend in it. And then some of the very last words of Peter's life before he would, according to history, be crucified upside down. He instructed his readers as way of, by way of reminders that he was giving them. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now let's make a connection. If we look around and we see numbers aren't what we want them to be, let's ask ourselves how much we've spiritually grown. And let's not point fingers at each other based on the class from Romans chapter 14. Let's point the finger at ourselves. Okay, the numbers aren't what I'd like them to be. I'm talking to myself here mainly. The numbers aren't what I'd like them to be maybe. What can I do about that? Nothing until I grow spiritually. How's my spiritual growth? How's my knowledge of God's word? How's the application and wisdom? That growth has to come before any kind of other church growth can come. But then the third kind of church growth is organically. There are many different definitions to organically, but the one that fits this idea is that things just kind of happen naturally together. When those people were baptized on the day of Pentecost, they just started to bond. And all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them amongst themselves as anyone had need. Nobody forced them to do that. That wasn't communism. But they came together and they said, we're all bound by the blood of Christ now and I'm going to help you. We're going to help this person. We're going to help other people. That spirit continues when we send money to flood relief, when we send money to people in the Ukraine trying to find refuge from the war. That spirit continues when we send to our brethren. And that spirit continues when right here at home we get to know each other and we get along better. Paul wrote about the body of Christ, the church. In 1 Corinthians 12, 25, he said that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. You see that care when someone has a loved one that dies and a funeral meal was prepared by a whole bunch of people selflessly giving their time, their money, their resources to make a meal for that family. You see that kind of care when people behind the scenes give to one another, when people care for one another, when they go sit with a loved one so someone else can have a break when they're doing all kinds of service-oriented activities in the church without looking for a name in the bulletin and without looking for any recognition, you see this kind of organic growth. And then comes Acts 9.31 again, where you have all three principles of church growth. The churches among all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace. That's organic. They grew together. We're edified. That's being built up spiritually. And walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, that's walking by truth and being helped along by God, we're edified, or multiplied. That's numeric. It all works together. In addition, you might consider these passages as how the church has a radiating measure. After Paul was in Antioch and Pisidia in Acts chapter 13, he left that town in disgrace. He shook the dust off his feet from those people who rejected him. But verse 49 still sticks out as a bright beam of victory when it seemed that all was lost. And the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all that region. People were taking it. Paul the missionary was run out of town. But you know what they couldn't stop? The word of God. In Acts chapter 8, the church at Jerusalem suffered a great persecution so that their members were spread throughout all Judea and Galilee. They were just running for their lives. As they went, everywhere they went, they preached the word of God. Acts chapter 8 verse 4. And then in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, you see that that was sort of the plan all along. 
Jesus said to the apostles before he ascended, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be witnesses to me in, and then watch the radiation, Jerusalem, and then the country of Judea, and the area of Galilee, and then the area of Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts of the earth. That's the way the church grows. Can the church grow in our era? We need not ask the question. It is. Maybe not in our area, but it is. There are factors to consider. There are economic factors to consider where you have biological growth in the church, but, and the ones that stay faithful have to move away for jobs. There are other factors to consider in the fact that in the last 15 to 20 years, our culture has taken a nosedive towards secularism away from any kind of, any kind of feeling toward the God of the universe and responsibility toward him. I even read this morning that it's almost about 50% of the United States population that is married. It used to be 68%. It used to be 61%. And we're going to get to a point where people who are married and living together are going to be in the minority. Flouting the face of God's design in some respects. So there are things to consider. But I still believe in the power of the Word of God. The Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword and pierces even to the division of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. These passages teach us that if we will imbibe the Word of God and desire it like a newborn baby desires milk and want it more than anything else, that we will spiritually grow. Then local congregations will grow together and they will start growing numerically even though they might not know how. Because, as God said in Zechariah 4 verse 6, it's not by our devices, not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. If we just give our attention to faithfulness. But let's go beyond that, shall we? Faithfulness almost seems kind of passive, doesn't it? I don't mean to, I don't mean to insult anyone who uses that word. I use it myself all the time. But sometimes it gives to me a passive connotation. Well, I'll be faithful. I'll show up. I'll, do, I'll take the Lord's Supper. I remember the one preacher who said, I don't want to teach my children to be faithful. I want to teach them to be warriors for the cause of Christ. And of course he did not mean physical warfare and he did not mean violence. He meant in the vein of 2 Corinthians 10 verses 3 and 4 where the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Casting down every thought and imagination that lifts itself up against the knowledge of Christ. He means in the sense of the spiritual warfare that Ephesians 6 verse 12 speaks of. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. We got the wickedness all set, in arms, ready to go, fighting, coming at us every day. Is it possible? I ask you to ask yourself. Is it possible that I could grow, that you could grow, to be more and more and more prepared to be warriors for the cause of Christ. For the end goal. Saving people's souls. It's about love. It's about sacrifice. This world is not about me. And this world is not about you. With all due respect. This world is about Christ. And our service to him. He holds all things together by the word of his power. Hebrews 1. In him consists all things. This world is about him. When we give our lives to him. Then we have hope. Then we have expectation of making it past this life to something much, much greater. If you're not a Christian today, this whole plea around church growth is, again, not to fill our buildings and not to pad our coffers and not to just have a bunch of people on the rolls. This whole plea is because we want at least one more individual to go to heaven. And you do that by confessing a faith in Jesus as the Son of God, repenting of sins, being baptized in water, immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins, and then living faithfully, aggressively as a person who loves other people, wants to grow, wants to serve, wants to do better and better the rest of his or her life. If we could help you in one of those ways this morning, would you please come forward as we stand and sing?